Well, I feel rested. I'm in good voice. Wish I had my guitar. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. Um, for me, maybe not for you. It'd be a lot of fun for me. Uh, Sonny, we're praying for Lily. We're all praying for Lily. We're in her corner cheering her on. We love Lily. Amen. God bless you, brother. God bless you. I hope you're reading through the book of Joshua as we are going through Joshua in our sermon series. It really is a fascinating read. It is the God story. It is history, his story. It is uh, the story of God leading and providing and discipling and disciplining his people and bringing them into the promised inheritance. And one thing we are often reminded of as we read the book of Joshua is that God's people are people. They're just people, warts and all. They've got lots of flaws. They make mistakes. They make a lot of mistakes. Anybody here ever make mistakes? If so, I think we can very readily relate to uh, God's people in the book of Joshua. And we're going to read about one of those mistakes tonight, found in Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9, and we'll begin reading with verse 1. Uh, Zach got ahead of me. He was chapter 10 this morning, that uh, wonderful story when the sun stood still. And uh, so we're backing up just a little bit in events that led up to that. Joshua chapter 9, Now when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, that these things will be explained. The kings in the hill country and the western foothills and along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse, R-U-S-E in the NIV. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and pat sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. The Israelites said to the Hivites, But perhaps you live near us, so how can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, Who are you and where do you come from? They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country, because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt, verse 10, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we, that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are, and our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. And the Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. And that's the phrase I want you to remember. 
but did not inquire of the Lord. And then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. I want you to keep your Bible open, if you would, as we investigate this story a little bit. I've titled my message tonight, Oops, I'm a Very Simple Man. Now, that's a word you never want to hear your dentist say. Oops, and it was going so well. Oops, you really, you really didn't need that tooth, did you? <laughs> we all have to say oops from time to time, don't we? But God has a, an oops-free existence. God never makes a mistake. God never miscalculates. He never forgets. He is never careless. But we sure are. Could I get a witness? And the disciples were. And here in our text, Israel had a big, I mean a really big oops. First of all, the story presents a great fraud. Now in verse 1 and verse 2, we, we see uh, this representation of nations had heard about these things. These things or explained in verse 3 what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai. All the kings west of the Jordan, the six kings of the six ites, I love those ites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Termites. <laughs> yeah, I'll go that far for a laugh. They all conspired to go to war against Israel. Bad move on their part. Because it wasn't Israel they needed to fear. It wasn't Joshua they needed to fear. It was Israel's God they needed to fear. And then we come to verse 3. And you'll notice it's introduced with the word, however... So by way of contrast to these kings, the people of Gideon, rather than go to war against Israel, hearing uh, uh, rather than face the prospects of Israel's God, the people of Gideon pursued another plan. It was a plan of trickery, a scheme, a ploy. The NIV uses the word ruse. In verse 4, they resorted to a ruse. The King James Bible says they did work wilily. Wilily. That's a word akin to the word wiles. In a wily, cunning, or sly manner. The New Testament speaks of the wiles of the devil, doesn't it? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's got a bag full of tricks. And so they showed up and they said, look, we have come from a distant country in verse 6. A very distant country. A long way from you in verse 22. They will later reiterate. And we just want peace. We'd like to enter into a treaty with you. We've heard about your God, and we don't want any trouble. We just want peace. And it was all a guise, a pretense, a ruse. Everything they said was a lie. And not only did they tell a lie, they acted it out in great detail with great planning and premeditation. And they are good I mean really good. They show up and they say this bread was warm when we begin our journey. And look how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins renew when we set out. But, but look how worn out and cracked they are. And our sandals and our clothes are now worn out by this very long journey. It's amazing how good some liars are. It really is. I like to watch 
crime documentaries like 48 Hours and Dateline, preferably while I'm eating a large bowl of popcorn. And I've learned something in watching those shows. I would make a terrible detective. I'm always duped by the liars. I say, oh yeah, he's telling the truth. Look at his body language. He's innocent. He turns out to be the bad guy every time. So I too would have been suckered in by the Gibeonites. And so were the leaders of Israel. A treaty was agreed upon, and the prayerless leaders were all feeling pretty good about it. And three days later, the Israelites realized they had been duped. They learned how irresponsible they had been, and their grievous sin of omission will come back to haunt them. Always does. There was a great fraud. Secondly, there was a great failure. The failure led to the fraud, made it possible. Their weakness had been exposed now for all to see. Now, these are good men. I know they're sincere. They're earnest. And I'm sure overall they're spiritual leaders. The leaders worked. In fact, they had done the obvious. They looked at the evidence. But they forgot something, didn't they? They had not inquired of the Lord you know why we need to pray because things aren't always as they appear to be because the enemy comes in like an angel of light because without prayer and spiritual insight you cannot understand the reality you are in you cannot clearly see the picture that is right before you. It takes some revelation to know the reality you are facing. And the part of the story that pains me the most is the fact that it was the leaders who had not done their homework. It was the leaders who had not prayed. In verse 14, who did not inquire of the Lord. Israel's leaders Let them down. They failed to set the example. It's everybody's responsibility to pray, but you can't help but notice there is a lot of emphasis given here regarding the leaders. Look in verse 15. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Down in verse 18, but the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Verse 19, uh, but all the leaders answered we have given them our oath by the lord again in verse 18 the whole assembly grumbled against the leaders you see the leaders were sincere the leaders worked but they did not pray they leaned upon their own understanding and isn't that a battle we leaders have to constantly constantly face you see the leaders forgot what had brought them this far. The leaders didn't even have the insight and the understanding and the conviction of their enemies because in verse 9, they answered, your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. We have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt. You say, well, who's a leader? Well, anybody who comes to church on a drizzly Sunday night during a pandemic is a leader. Consider yourself a leader. Do you know why we need to pray? To protect us from our own sinful inclinations and to protect us from the wiles of the devil, to protect us from his endless array of ruses. He's a liar and the father of lies. 
I bet you he told me a dozen lies before I came up here to preach tonight. He is a deceiver. He comes in as an angel of light, but he only brings darkness. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever forgotten something that was really important? Anybody here ever do that? Jeff, just you and me, buddy. All right. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> have you ever gotten to your car, maybe, and just started up and realized you didn't have your keys? Do you remember how you felt? Yeah. A few weeks ago, uh, I was going to Subway to buy lunch, backed out of the garage, forgot to look behind me, oops, <laughs> ran into my daughter's car, child abuse. Well, I went to Subway, came home with Subway sandwiches and told my daughter and son-in-law, by the way, I smashed my car into your car. Now, enjoy your sandwiches. <laughs> I called the insurance agent up, told him about it, and my new insurance agent, now he wonders, what have we done? I told him what I'd done. He said, Don, don't worry about it. He said, I backed into my daughter's car twice. I said, you're my kind of guy. So have you ever looked back on your life and you ask, how could I have forgotten something so obvious, so important, so necessary? Like, why didn't I look in the rearview mirror? Or maybe like, why didn't I pray about a situation? It's like that old story. You probably have heard it. I want you to hear it again because it fits in. It's, it's a lady who wanted a pet, and she didn't want a dog, and she didn't like cats. So she went to the pet store, and after consulting with the owner of the pet store, they gleefully decided to buy a parrot. And I, I like parrots. I don't want one, but I like them. I'm fascinated by them. And this was going to be a special parrot because it would, it would talk to her. It would help keep her company. And uh, she was told that after the little parrot adjusted and got acclimated to its in new environment, it, it, it would be talking. Well, she brought the parrot home and waited, and a few days went by, and the bird never said a word. So she went back to the store and said, I bought the parrot, and he's never said a word. The owner said, well, you know, here's a swing. Put that in the cage, and that will help the little guy relax and help him to feel more at home. So she's heartened by this prospect, and so she goes home. She puts the swing in the cage, and, and sure enough, the little guy jumped on the swing, and he's swinging back and forth, and never, never, never said a word. She went back to the store owner, and she said, he's still not talking. He said, well, let's put this little ladder in the cage. He'll walk up and down that. I'm sure that will loosen him up, and he'll talk. So the ladder goes into the cage, and sure enough, the bird walks but he doesn't talk. Back to the store. The owner, who is never without an answer, says, you know, I, I, I just think he's lonely. And uh, put this little mirror in the cage, and when he sees his reflection, <laughs> he'll be a happy bird, and a happy bird is a talking bird. So along the ladder in the swing, she's got the mirror in there, and the bird looks in the mirror, and not a word and finally, the lady sticks her head right up to the cage, and she says, I've given you everything. I've given you a home, a swing, a ladder, a mirror. Why don't you talk to me? And the little bird says, don't they sell any food in that pet store? <laughs> she forgot the main thing. And Israel forgot the main thing, didn't they? They forgot God. They forgot to inquire of the Lord. And when you forget that, you have fallen prey to the perils of pride. Pride goes before a fall. When you forget that, you've just brought yourself a ton of headaches, all of the migraines. They didn't pray. And we never get to the place where we don't need to study the Scriptures and seek the Lord and walk humbly before Him. Why this dereliction of duty? I think it all goes back to the source of, of all our 
all our sin, the source of all our sin, and that's pride. They felt self-sufficient. They got haughty. They failed to realize their victories in the past were the Lord's doings, not theirs. They had forgotten the all-important words of Joshua chapter 1, the land I am about to give them, God had said. I will give you every place where your foot will set. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. They forgot it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. A great fraud and a great failure. And thirdly, there was a great forfeiture. So what's the great tragedy here? You know, it's, uh, it's not immediate and it's not obvious. All due to the mercy of God. Because God could have intervened with harshness. It may take some time for this to play out, but it will play out. Israel's not going to get off the hook. They're not going to get through this unscathed. They're not going to sow without reaping. So what price did Israel have to pay? What judgment did they have to face? Well, I actually see a couple of judgments they had to face. The first one is the, was the tragedy in the sin itself. The spiritual negligence that was so self-revealing. Oh, my Lord, how painful that is. And now they, they were all exposed. The leadership was exposed. Their spiritual lethargy and vulnerability was now revealed. They were like Samson who said, I'll go out as before, but he did not know the Lord had left him. They're going to have to live with a revelation of their pride and their misplaced priorities. The leaders are going to have to live with a track record. They blew it. The whole country is unsettled. Nine, chapter 9, verse 18 says, The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders. The foundation is cracked, and the future is in jeopardy. Then secondly was the fact that Israel was now compromised They are in an especially vulnerable situation. They have put themselves into a box and there seems to be no way out. Danger is at hand and they will have to live with it. These visitors, these Gibeonites, had not come from afar. The fact is they were next door neighbors. Gibeon was only six miles northwest of Jerusalem, and they had shown themselves to be opportunists and liars and deceivers, and now the enemy is in the camp. The world had come into the church, and when the world comes into the church, the world always wins. A little leaven leaveneth the whole loaf. They got cozy with the Gibbonites, these worshipers of false gods. Has the world come into the church today? I think it has done it so subtly, we're not even aware. And sometimes I think we ought to go back to first base. Sometimes I just think uh, the world has not only come into the church in large measure, it has taken over the church. And sometimes... I think it'd be better just to strip it all down and start all over with just the basics. Prayer, teaching and preaching of God's Word, worship, evangelism. No glitz, no glamour, no entertainment. Take out the lights, take out the drums, the guitars, the piano, take the padding out of the pews. Give the people a Bible and a hymn book and have church. I almost said take out the coffee, but I didn't want to get stoned to death before the night was over. I said sometimes I think that. I don't think that all the time, but I do think all the time that we have to be really, really careful that we don't let these things distract us, that we don't focus on anything other than 
Jesus. In the, in the New Testament, they had even less than what I just mentioned. They, they had nothing. It was just raw and real, and their focus was on Jesus. So the day will come when the Gibeonites will eventually cause the north and south tribes of Israel to separate and to be isolated from each other. And they will pay a painful price. When the world enters the church, it's only a matter of time before the compromised church becomes so weakened it loses its way and it fails in its mission. Seven of the saddest words in the book of Joshua are mine tonight. I get to share those with you. But did not inquire of the Lord. Let's don't let these be our words. Now tonight we have the enlightenment of history to stir our hearts to pray. The Apostle Paul in writing about the history of Israel said these things happen unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition so let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There's a time to preach, there's a time to sing, there's a time to work, and there's a time to pray. And surely, now is the time to pray.